So let's start with this. Force net, force applied plus force opposing. And listen to me. It is only the net for, and only, only the net force that equals mass times acceleration. Okay, that's the only one. Okay, out of out of all the forces you're going to study, net force is the only one that equals mass times acceleration. Now, what you see is that sometimes your net force is gravity, if that's the only force acting on it. Sometimes your net force is friction, if that's the only force acting on it. Okay? Sometimes your applied force is your net force, if that's the only force acting on it. Okay? But a lot of times you're going to see like this con conflict between what you're trying to do and gravity mafia working against you or the friction mafia working against you, which you have to pay off. So if you look on this very first one, here's the semi moving along, okay, boom, all right? And this thing is going to be moving along. It has a large mass. It has a large amount of inertia. It does not want to stop. It wants to keep going. So the first thing you want to do, like you get in a problem like this, you go, and I don't know what to do. Start with the basics. Go, okay, well, I know there's gravity pulling it down, and I know I can find my gravitational force if I need it by taking mass times g. You have the mass in the problem, not a big deal, okay? Then you also know that force normal on a flat surface is going to be the same as your gravitational force, same magnitude, opposite direction, okay? And then the problem here comes down to the horizontal forces. Well, the truck is moving in this direction, right? And we want to stop the truck. Well, the applied force would be if you were pushing down on the gas pedal or there was a rocket engine strapped to the truck or something like that to try and make it go forward, okay? There's nothing trying to make it go forward. And don't confuse inertia with the force. Inertia is just a tendency to maintain a constant velocity, okay? So does it have inertia? Yeah. Does it want to keep moving? Yeah. But that's not a force, okay? So the only force that can possibly make this thing stop is a frictional force going in the opposite direction. So if you set up this chart, then you go force applied plus force opposing equaling force net, okay? And you realize, well, hmm, there is no applied force because there's no engines, there's nothing, there's nothing like that. So that means my opposing force has to be my net force, and my net force is mass times acceleration. You know the initial velocity, you know the final velocity, and you know the distance. So you can calculate the acceleration of that truck. Multiply that by the mass, there's your net force, which is also then your opposing force. And that opposing force is going to be friction. So if you look at this and you want to find that force that's going to stop it, all that is is mass times acceleration. Okay, that's it. And that frictional force is the net force because there's nothing working against it. So that answer on number one should be a really big number, like something times 10 to the fifth, okay? Now, when you get to number two, you want to calculate the coefficient of friction. So there's two ways you can do this. One, you can go old school, <coughs> force friction over force normal. You just found the force friction, okay? That was your answer to number one. You know what that number is. You can find force normal by going, oh, that's the same as my gravitational force, which is mass times your gravitational acceleration. So you can take the mass, that's 9.8 meters per second squared, and get that number and do that. It's great. It works. It's fantastic. Okay? Now, if you want to be efficient and save yourself a little bit of heartache, the other thing that you could do is realize, well, in this situation, force friction is my net force, which is mass times acceleration. Normal is the same as gravity, which is mg. My masses cancel out. So the other thing that you could do on number two is take the ratio of the acceleration that you found up above and divide that by g. 
you're going to get the same answer. So there's a couple, remember, there's three things to remember about mu. It's that it's rarely, rarely, rarely above one. In this case, it isn't, by the way. It's never negative because it's an absolute value. And it has no units because it's a ratio of newtons or it's a ratio of something. Okay? So mu is almost always less than one. Never negative and never has any units on it. Okay. When you get to number three, here's the contrast between the first problem and, the, and, and problem number three. On number three, here's this chair, okay? And you're going to push this thing along at a constant velocity, okay? So as soon as you see constant velocity, what are you going to make all the forces add up to? Zero. Zero. Nothing weird, negative, not negative, pi, or something like that. This is zero. And then sit here and go, okay, well, what are the forces acting on this thing? Well, gravity's trying to pull it down. Normal is acting up. I'm going to have some frictional force. And I'm going to have some applied force. So if I can find, in this situation, you got 16.4 newtons. So the first thing you have to figure out is that which of those four forces is that? Well, it says it's required to pull a six and a half kilogram chair. So that value, 16.4 newtons, is your applied force. And here's the bigger idea that you have to keep in mind. Is that the only reason you ever have to apply a force to keep something moving is because there's friction acting against it or because there's gravity or there's something else acting against it. Because if you could eliminate the opposing forces of the frictional mafia or the gravity mafia, you could just give something a push and it would just go. So like if you're in deep space or if you have the friction of the surface, all you have to do is just give something a push and it would just keep going and going and going and going and going. So if you ever have to keep applying a force to keep something moving, that means because there's a force acting against it. So if that applied force is 16.4, that means your frictional force is negative 16.4 newtons. Okay? That's it. And you're trying to find mu, which is force friction over force normal. Oh, force friction, you have that number. That's the 16.4. The force normal is just the same as your gravitational force, which is just mg. So your coefficient of friction on number three should be around 0.3. Okay, that's an ish, but it's a ballpark around 0.3. Now, you get to number four. You have 18 Newton forces applied to a one half kilogram box at rest. What's the acceleration of the box? So number four is the easiest problem on the entire assignment, okay? Here's this box. You're going to apply a force of 18 newtons. Yes, gravity is acting down. Force normal is acting up. But I don't care about those because that, that isn't in the direction of motion. So unless you're given information, which you're not, about being able to calculate the opposing force of gravity or the frictional mafia, you just go, oh, 18 newtons. That's my net force. Divide that by the mass, there's your acceleration. So your acceleration on number four should be between 10 and 15 meters per second squared. It is the easiest problem on the entire assignment. Just take 18 newtons and divide it by the mass. That's all you have to do. Okay? That's all you have to do. Do not make this difficult. It's the easiest problem on the entire assignment because there's nothing working against it. Now, when you get to number five, okay? So in number five, we're going to up the ante. It's the same 18 newton force, but now I've given you the coefficient of friction. So now you have to be able to calculate how much frictional force there is acting in the opposite direction that's going to oppose that. So you have to figure out, hey, how much money do we have to pay off to the gravity mafia? Okay? That's what you have to figure out. So in this situation, you're going to go, oh, mu times force normal equals your force friction. That's the same as Fg, which is mu... Mg. Okay? There you go. So yeah, I've given you mu, 
You know what the mass is. You know what G is. Multiply the three numbers together. So that answer to number five should be around eight newtons. Okay? It's an ish, but it's something around eight newtons. So here's the setup. Here's this box. And this is this, is this battle that's going on. You have an applied force of 18 newtons. Okay? That's trying to make the box go. The frictional mafia is acting in the opposite direction of about negative 8 newtons. Okay? So you have 18 newtons. You have to pay $8 to the gravity mafia. You have $10 left over. So that's your net force. That's what's left over to actually make the box move. Okay? So your net force, oddly enough, on number seven is around 10 newtons. Okay? And then you're going to take that net force and divide that by the mass to get that acceleration, which should be less than your answer to number four, because on number four, you didn't have to pay off the gravity mafia. On number eight, you do have to pay off the gravity mafia, so you have less money left over, so therefore you don't get as big an acceleration. Okay? Makes sense. Now, on these diagrams, okay, these are drawn to scale. I want to see, hey, Mr. Burkham, I let two centimeters or three centimeters, whatever that is, equal one newton. Okay? I want to see, you have to show me what that scale is. So the first diagram is going to look something like this. Fg, Fn, force applied, force opposing. Okay? So the first diagram is going to look like. Draw it to scale. This is like 18 newtons. That's 8 newtons. Mg, boom, there you go. Okay? That's what that diagram is going to look like. Then you're going to draw it tip to tail. I always draw my gravitational force first. Fg. Here's my force applied. Here's my force normal. Here's your force friction. Now, here's the story. And again, this is, this is the bigger idea. The reason that this thing accelerates is because your applied force of 18 newtons is bigger than your frictional force going back in the opposite direction. Okay? That's what allows you to accelerate. If these two forces were the same, you just, be, you just have a constant velocity. Okay? So, gravity's pulling it down. You have a certain amount of applied force. You have your normal force. You don't end up back at the origin, so you have to draw that resultant force. Remember, resultant goes from the origin out. It's like the kangaroo. Oh, so you got to come in here and complete that triangle by drawing the resultant force, pushing back in the opposite direction, and that's what allows you to accelerate. So you're only going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. And remember, just remember this. Every problem I give you is only one of two things. Either your net force equals zero and you have a constant velocity, or your net force doesn't equal zero and you accelerate. And if you accelerate, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to speed up or you're going to slow down. And those are the only two possible things that could happen. Okay? Constant velocity, acceleration motion, Accelerated motion, you speed up, you slow down. Okay, now let's talk about the rocket. So here's the rocket. You've got an upward force of 129 newtons. And it has a mass of whatever that is, mass of 5 kilograms. Now, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. I'm going to give you a problem like this on the test. Okay, it's going to be in the bottom of the front page. I'll tell you exactly where the problem is going to be. Okay, the first one like this. That's where that's going to be. And here's what you're going to do wrong. I'm going to ask you to find the acceleration. And you're just going to take 129 newtons, and you're going to divide that by five kilograms, and you're going to go, oh, there's my acceleration. This working in physics is easy. Force equals mass times acceleration. Okay. 
But the Gravity Mafia at this point is not going to be happy because you have not paid off the Gravity Mafia. So unless I explicitly, 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 explicitly tell you not to worry about gravity, you have to pay off the Gravity Mafia. Okay? So you've got to take five kilograms, and, and remember, the Gravity Mafia's, their, their fee structure is based on the fact that they're going to charge you $9.80 for every kilogram of mass that you want to lift up in the air. That's, that's their fee, okay, if you want to think of it in terms of money. That's $9.80 per kilogram. You have $129. You need to take 5 times, times 980 and go, oh, this is how much I have to set aside to pay off the Gravity Mafia because that's how much they're going to charge, okay? Because Gravity Mafia always wants their money. Okay, they got, they got to be the mafia for a reason. So, then, once you subtract that out, and you're going to go, okay, you want to draw some vectors. Okay, there's my applied force going up. That's 129 newtons. You've got a gravitational force acting down. Boom. There's my net force. And it's only your net force that equals mass times acceleration. So if you do that right, your answer to 10C should be something around your age, okay? That's an ish, but it's something around your age, okay? Then you're going to fire this engine for 12.6 seconds. This is where you got to go old school. you got to go V equals V naught plus AT. The initial velocity of the rocket is zero. You know your acceleration, find your time. And you have your time. So your answer to 10D should be around 200 meters per second, okay? So that's how fast that thing is going when you shut off the rocket engines, about 200 meters per second. Pretty good clip, okay? Not the speed of sound, but you're, you're going pretty fast. Now, here's the next thing. So at the end of this time, I'm going to shut off the rocket engines. And all of these, oddly enough, if you look at force applied, plus force opposing, here's your force net. So initially we had 129 Newton applied force. We had an opposing force of negative 49 Newtons. We had a net force of 80 Newtons, okay? That's what we had, boom, there you go. Now, at the end of 12.6 seconds, we shut off the engines. So Jack, I shut off the engines. What ha what's the value of my applied force? Zero. Zero, okay? So after I shut off the engines, I can still go back to that same chart, okay, the exact same chart. Here it is. Now my applied force is zero. Jack, is the gravity mafia still trying to pull the rocket down? Yes. Yes. So my opposing force is still negative 49 newtons. So that's like me throwing this ball up in the air, okay? So while it's in contact with my hand, that's the similar situation of the rocket engine being fired. As soon as it leaves my hand, the only force acting on it is gravity, that force is pointing downward, I get an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So as soon as you shut off the engines, my net force is negative 49 newtons, and if you want to find the acceleration, Hey, take negative 49 newtons and divide it by the mass. Oddly enough, you're going to get negative 9.8 newtons per second squared because that's the acceleration caused by gravity. Okay. So then when you get to G, I'm not asking you what the maximum height is. I'm asking you when does it reach its maximum height. So here's the story. So you've got 12.6 seconds on your velocity time graph. It took you 12.6 seconds to go to about 200 meters per second, okay? Now, notice that this line is positive and sloping upward. Oh, I have a positive acceleration. That's your answer to number 10C. So you want to write down the net force and you want to write down the acceleration during that time during that time. Now, at this point, I shut off the engines. Now, here's the story. And this is going to be important in terms of the lab that you're going to start today. If you look at a velocity time graph, and this is a logic problem, 
you look at a velocity time graph, the slope of a velocity time graph gives you acceleration. Okay? And net force equals mass times acceleration. So if you see a change in the slope, not this change in sign, okay, but if you just see the change in the slope of a velocity time graph, that means you're changing the acceleration. The only way you can change the acceleration is to change the net force. Okay, so this is a logic problem. So you see a change in the slope on a velocity time graph, that means you change the acceleration. The only way you can change the acceleration is to change the net force. Okay, and the only way you can change the net force with a rocket is to change the applied force. It's just like with the helicopter. If I want the helicopter to accelerate upward, I'm going to give it more throttle. If I want the, excel if I want the helicopter to accelerate downward, I'm going to give it less throttle. Okay, so I'm going to, by changing the applied force, I change the net force. By changing the net force, I change the acceleration. So you shut off the engines. This line begins to slope down here like this, okay? And keep a running clock, okay? So you have 12.6 seconds plus the additional time it takes to reach the maximum height, okay? So that final answer on uh, G should be low to mid 30 seconds, because that's the total time. And that's when this is going to cross zero, okay? Anything else on the assignment? Hopefully that clarified a whole bunch of things. Hey. Can you I can talk about that. So let's look at Okay, so your engines can only apply so much value. So your, plot, your force applied is a fixed value. Okay, that's it. You can't change that, right? That's a certain number. Based upon a certain rocket, this is a certain number. Okay, now what's creating, so here's your rocket, okay? So you have a certain amount of force applied, okay? True? So what's creating the opposing force? The gravity mafia or the frictional mafia? Gravity. gravity mafia. How does the gravity mafia figure out how much money that they get paid? What's their formula? Yeah. Mg, right? So if you have, if you can reduce the mass, you reduce the amount of money you have to pay the gravity mafia, right? So if this is a fixed value and I reduce my applied force, what happens to my net force? It becomes, larger. it becomes larger. So then you get a bigger net force, right? Now, net force also equals mass times acceleration. True? So the advantage of decreasing the mass is that it's actually a two-fold bonus. If you decrease the mass, you increase the net force. But then, to calculate the acceleration, then you're dividing by a smaller mass, which makes the acceleration get even bigger, because you have less stuff to move. Okay? So, that's what. So, by decreasing the mass, you increase the net force, and you have less stuff to move, so you get a bigger acceleration. Okay? All right, anything else? Going once, going twice, so make sure I beg of you, on those diagrams for the rockets, you should have three distinct set of diagrams for those rockets. When the engine is being fired, then when it's approaching maximum height, and then when it's starting to fall from that maximum height. So you can do them on that blue paper, you can do them on another sheet of paper, I care not. But just make sure that I know which diagrams are which. Engines fired on the way up, on the way down. On the vector diagrams, make sure that I, you, I see your scale, okay? You should have four forces labeled. Applied, friction, normal, gravity on the box that's being pushed, okay? Got it good, Grant? Okay, get those handed in, stop that. Okay. So, lab that you're going to do, 
is uh, dealing with getting and landing a spaceship on the moon. Well, before you get it to the moon, you have to get it off the surface of the Earth. So this is kind of a cool animation because it shows you the different ways that rocket engines work, depending upon the situation and what you want to do. So there's two broad classifications of rocket engines. One is what we call a solid rocket fuel. So if you look like, here's the space shuttle launch, okay? And it's cool because it shows you like the different types of fuel. And so like blue is liquid hydrogen, uh, red is kerosene, yellow is liquid oxygen. And so these, like the space shuttle runs off liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, but it also has solid rocket boosters on the side. These are the more modern rockets and they work off that same idea. So these are solid rocket boosters. So the beauty of solid rocket boosters, they have a couple of advantages. Number one, if you look at like a solid rocket booster, they're called the big, dumb, heavy re-engines. Because they're, because they're a solid fuel, they're relatively easy to build. But the problem is, is that once you light them, you can't shut them off, okay? You can't throttle them back. You can't adjust how much force you get from them. It's a one-time hit, okay? Once you light a solid rocket booster, you can't shut it off, okay? Now, the advantage of the other engines, like these traditional, what you would associate, like this is like the Saturn V rocket. This is the one that got us to the moon. So the advantage of the fuel pumps is that you can idle them back, okay? You can adjust how much force you're getting from the engine. So you can change the applied force. So you can determine like, okay, hey, maybe we want, how much throttle do we want? How much acceleration do we want? So, but, the disadvantage of them is that you have to handle these different propellants. So if you look at the space shuttle engines right here on the back on the back of the space shuttle, they operate off of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Okay, so to give you some idea, liquid hydrogen is, and they always want to run off liquid, okay? Mainly because of the fact that in a given amount of space, as a liquid, you can have a lot more molecules of hydrogen or oxygen gas in a liquid than you can as a gas, okay? That's the advantage of it. Now, the disadvantage of it is that it's really, 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 really cold. So liquid hydrogen is the second coldest liquid on Earth. Liquid helium is the coldest liquid on Earth. Liquid hydrogen is the second coldest liquid on Earth. And that's a whole discussion in AP chemistry about why it's so cold, basically because hydrogen isn't very really sticky, so to get it as a liquid, you have to get it really, 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 really cold. Oxygen molecules are bigger, and so they're stickier, so it's easier to have liquid oxygen. So liquid hydrogen is really, 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 really cold. Second coldest liquid on Earth. So when you combine liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in these pumps, here's the problem is that you have, these pumps have to handle really, 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 really <coughs> cold liquids, okay? Liquid hydrogen, second coldest liquid on Earth. So if you've ever seen what happens when it gets really, really cold outside, it's metal contracts, okay? Because it's really, really cold. But when metal heats up, it expands. And so here's the problem with these engines, is that the engineers have to be able to handle the pumps that contain liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen or liquid kerosene, okay, whatever the case may be, especially the liquid hydrogen, second coldest liquid on Earth. But after it ignites with the oxygen, and you all saw that on Friday when I set off that hydrogen balloon, okay, and that was, a real, that was just a small amount of hydrogen, okay, and that got a pretty big explosion from that little bit of hydrogen. Well, and also, for those of you that were close, you felt that heat. Like, ooh, right? Because that's what, that's what you want as a rocket fuel. You want a fuel that will, when it ignites, it expands. And that's what pushes that rocket, that rocket engine up. So if you look at these pumps, 
They have to handle liquid hydrogen, second coldest liquid on Earth. Once it burns with the hydrogen and oxygen, that temperature goes up so high that that temperature is hot enough to boil iron, okay? Not melt iron, not get it glowing hot, to boil iron, okay? So imagine I gave you this iron cart and said, hey, boil this thing, okay? Y'all seen, y'all have done chemistry labs. You know how tough it is to even get water to boil? Imagine that I give you this task. Hey, I want you to make this thing boil, right? That's going to take some really, 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 really high temperatures to boil iron. So, obviously, you can't build this thing out of iron in terms of the exhaust nozzle. Because if you build it out of iron, I was like, well, that's cool. And so you light the engine, and then all that metal is just going to boil. So it's a huge engineering challenge. How do you build these pumps to take these exceptionally cold liquids have them ignite, produce a tremendous amount of force, raise the temperature so high that it would boil normal iron, and maintain that temperature in some semblance of control. But these are very, very complex pumps and things to because you've got to mix such high volumes. So later on when we get into momentum, we'll talk more about this. But one way you can measure force is the amount of fuel it consumes per unit of time. So all these engines consume about five to 10,000 kilograms of fuel per second, okay? So to give you some perspective, a small car has a mass of about 2,000 kilograms, okay, roughly. So these engines are burning through the mass of like two cars per second, okay? But you have to have that to generate that much force. Now, here's where Newton's laws come into motion, okay? So, if you run this for a little bit, okay? No one would run this, okay? Now, look at this from Newton's laws of motion. First law says objects in motion remain in motion. Objects at rest remain at rest. And this also known as the law of inertia. Okay? So, as these rockets burn fuel, what happens to the mass of the rockets? It goes less, right? They're burning fuel. Just like if you fill up your car with gas, your car full of gas has more mass than when your car is empty, okay? Because you have all that gasoline inside, right? So the same thing is true of ha is happening of these rockets. So as these rockets consume fuel, the amount of opposing force is becoming less. So this goes back to what, what Peyton had asked about earlier. I'm not changing the force from the rocket engines, okay? That's a fixed value. So my applied force vector pointing up is staying the same, okay? That's pointing up. Now, the other thing that's, on, that the only way these rockets can get off the launch pad is if the applied force going up is bigger than the opposing force going down. If that applied force going up isn't bigger than the opposing force, it's not gonna get off the launch pad. So like this, say for example, Carson is down in, in, the, in the weight room, okay? And she's trying to lift 400 pounds. Okay, right, 400 pounds, solid, right, 400 pounds. So if she grabs a hold of that barbell, she's going, ah, right? And let's say Carson can only apply 399 pounds of, of lift, okay? She's trying to lift 400 pounds. God bless her, she can only apply 399 pounds. If, are you going to be able to lift that barbell? No, because she can only apply 399 pounds. But... If she could apply 401 pounds, if you could apply 401 pounds, would you be able to lift the barbell? Yes. 
So all, these, all this engine has to do is to be able to apply a force bigger than the weight of the rocket. Okay, you just have to have a positive net force. So the force from these engines only has to overcome the weight. As long as it does that, you're cool. Now, if you don't, a rocket's not going anywhere. You could have the most impressive engines in the entire world. <laughs> Fire, <laughs> smoke, okay, all this stuff, right? That applied force going up, if that isn't bigger than the weight of the rocket, you're not getting off the launch pad. Just like Carson could go down there, oh, I'm buff, oh, right? So, oh, right? And she can lift 399 pounds. And that's impressive. But she's not going to be able to lift a 400-pound barbell. But if she can apply 401 pounds, then she's going to have a positive one-pound net force. She can lift the barbell. Okay? So the same thing is going to happen with these rockets. The applied force going up just has to be bigger than the opposing force going down. So what's going to happen is that as these rocket engines fire, they're consuming mass. So Newton's first law says, oh, hey, that's the law of inertia. Okay, first law says that you're decreasing the amount of force. Cool, okay? Because excuse me, you're decreasing the amount of mass because you're burning through it. So the inertia is becoming less, okay? Second law that says F equals MA. Now, this thing of all three of the laws, in terms of rocket science, the second law is the most important because it says F equals MA. But remember, that's your net force. So as you burn through the fuel, you have the same amount of upward force. The opposing force is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller because you have less and less mass to accelerate. Oh, right. I have less of an opposing force. So Carson trying to lift this thing, the longer she lifts, the mass of that barbell actually becomes smaller. It goes from 400 down to 390, down to 380, down to 370, down to 360. Okay, and that's the, oh, now I can lift it easier because the mass has become less, okay? So in terms of F equals MA, you have to understand both sides of this. The net force, okay, the net force is becoming bigger because you have less than an opposing force. The mass is becoming smaller because you have less stuff inside the rocket. So your acceleration actually increases. So if you were to look at a graph of uh, and we haven't talked about acceleration versus time graphs but if you were to look at an acceleration time graph for a rocket it might start off only here like at three meters per second squared okay Applied force is just bigger than the opposing force. You get a certain acceleration. But as time goes by, your acceleration actually becomes bigger because of the fact that as time goes by, you have the same force applied, but you're shrinking your opposing force and you're shrinking your mass. So your acceleration actually becomes bigger. Okay. So I know we've always said, oh, you, you assume your acceleration remains constant. In terms of a rocket launch, it actually doesn't. Your acceleration actually becomes bigger, so your acceleration is accelerating. If that makes sense. Okay, so you run this for a little bit. Now, what's happening that you see on this heavy lift rocket and on the space shuttle, as soon as those solid rocket boosters are empty, 
there's no need in having them around. Okay, they're not they're not serving, serving any purpose. So what they do is they jettison <clears throat> these solid rocket boosters that are equipped with parachutes. They land in the ocean. They recover them. They fill they fill them up and they can reuse them again and again and again. So that's the that's the other advantage of solid rocket boosters is that if you can you can recover them and just fill them back up. It's almost like a, if you ever shot off fireworks at, at Fourth of July, it's like a Roman candle. That's the best analogy I can give you for solid rocket boosters. Houston, you are go first base Let's get one other point here. Come on. Okay. So if you look at what just happened with the Saturn V rocket, Saturn V rocket actually had three stages to it. So the lower stage, that was the big heavy lift engine, okay? That got us almost into orbit. And to the point that, and, and we'll talk about orbit later on, and if you're in orbit, all that means is you're just in a state of free fall around the Earth. So then they've got the second stage and the third stage. This part of the rock is actually where the like, like command module is, which we need to know for the lab. So the command module they actually took and landed on the, on the moon was actually this little bit right here. So out of that entire Saturn V rocket that went to the moon, the only thing that returns back is the very top of that capsule. Everything else gets jettisoned, gets burned up, gets left on the moon. The only thing that returns is that tiny little capsule right up there at the top. So the purpose of the second engine is, is they fire the engines and they've got to shoot us from the Earth's orbit into the moons. We'll talk more about that later. Space shuttle stays in near Earth orbit. This would be like launching a satellite. So you'd have a satellite up on here. So if you look at like, hey, how does my phone keep track of where I am? We'll talk more about this. But the, the, your phone keeps track of where you are based upon what's known as a GPS satellite, global positioning satellites. We have a whole bunch of them that circle around the Earth, and you're always sending that signal off of those satellites, and that's how you know where you are. Uh, and this is going to be the same thing. That's just going to lift the satellite up in the air. Okay, so got the idea. Now, hello, it's Scott Man. This guy has an idea. From the SLS launch because this is first rate rocket porn. This is all still very relevant because. Okay, so let me just kind of point out the differences in the fuel and how you can tell. So, this is nice because it shows you that this contrast. So, if you look at launching the space shuttle, it was important how they did the sequence. They would actually fire these engines first. You had three main engines right here. And you can tell those were burning liquid, liquid hydrogen and oxygen because that's almost a clear to bluish flame. Now, this is where you get into Newton's laws again. So they would fire these engines first, and they would run them for about five seconds because these are running off of pumps, okay? So they would fire these engines because that way, if there was a problem with those three engines because they were run off of pumps, you could shut them down. It's like, okay, hey, let's make sure these work before we ignite the solid rocket boosters. Because once you ignite those solid rocket boosters, there is no turning back. You cannot shut them off. So they would fire these engines first. And it would be impressive. It was like, oh, ground would shake. Okay, it was cool. But you wouldn't get off the ground. So even though you're firing these three engines, the applied force going up was less than the gravitational force acting downward. So what that means, even if you had those three engines firing, if you pulled that launch pad out from underneath it, the space shuttle would begin to accelerate downward. Just like if I went behind Hector and pulled the chair out from underneath him, Hector is going to begin to accelerate downward because that's the direction of his net force. So they fire these three engines first, okay? Make sure everything checks out, then they ignite the solid rocket boosters. So this is cool because it shows it from a couple of different angles. SLS is going to use the same rocket engines. It's going to use practically the same booster design. 
it's very likely going to use. So now, once they kick these engines in, and like I said, that's what we've got to talk about. All rock is basically, it, it's, you have one of two options. You either have pumps that run liquid fuels, or you have solid rocket boosters. So this, in contrast, these engines actually burn uh, a compound called aluminum and iron oxide. And so that combination, when it ignites, produces a very, very distinct, very, very bright flame. So this is also how you can tell the difference between the types of flame that you have. If it's a clear blue, hey, you're burning hydrogen and oxygen. If it's a dark yellow, you left a solid rocket booster range. Okay. Okay, stop that for a second. I'm going to switch over to... Okay, so the lab that you're going to start today, and we're actually going to do tomorrow, is in terms of this computer program. And there's supposed to be a new version of this program that they're supposed to have loaded on laptops. This is the old version. I'm not sure which one is going to be working tomorrow, but it's not going to make any difference. Here's the main idea. Is that this is trying to land something, a lunar command module on the moon. So when I wrote this program, here's the parameters that I set. The mass of the lunar command module is 5,000 kilograms. Even though it's burning fuel, we're just going to assume that that mass is going to remain constant. In this program, how I define everything, anything going down and left is negative, velocity, acceleration, force, whatever that is. Anything going up and right is positive, force, acceleration, displacement, whatever it is. Okay? So what the program does is that it keeps track of the acceleration in the x direction, so any horizontal direction. So you have little side engines here that you can fire to, to make the craft move left and right. You have the value of the main thruster. This is what this is showing you here. Okay? That has a maximum value of 10,000. So if you go full throttle, boom, ram the engines, you can produce a maximum of 10,000 newtons. Okay? This weighs 5,000 kilograms. Excuse me, it has a mass of 5,000 kilograms. G on the moon is 1.67 meters per second squared. So obviously, if this thing is going to be able to accelerate upward, which is what I'm doing right now, you know your applied force has to be bigger than your opposing force, because that's the only way you can get a positive acceleration is to make the applied force bigger than the opposing force. So it also keeps track of your vertical acceleration. So notice that right now my AY is 0 0.21 meters per second squared. I have a positive acceleration. So the only way, and think this through, ah, oh, Mr. Burkham, you have a positive acceleration. The only way you can have a positive acceleration is to have a positive net force. The only way I can have a positive net force is the applied force from the engines has to be bigger than the opposing force of gravity. So if you look at this acceleration and that's a positive value, that means your applied force is bigger than the weight of the ship. If this acceleration is a negative value, that means my applied force is less than the weight of the ship. Okay, that's it. Here's my vertical velocity, 0 0.44, which means I'm moving up because I have a positive velocity. This keeps track of time. Here's the value of my main thruster. So my value of my main thruster is 9,400 newtons. Notice here with that 9,400 newtons, I have a positive acceleration. So what that tells me is that even if, even if at this point I don't know how much this thing weighs, I know that what it weighs has to be less than 9,400 newtons. I don't know how much, but I know it has to be less than that because of that, with that value, I'm producing a positive acceleration. Therefore, I know this upward force has to be bigger than the opposing force trying to pull this thing down. Okay, so what you want to try and do is land it on that launch pad with a velocity less than negative one meter per second. So the program says, hey, if you land with a velocity bigger than negative one, you've crashed and burned, bad things are going to happen. Okay? So let me run this right quick and kind of see what you got going.
Okay. Okay. All right. So, a couple of things to notice. This keeps track of my vertical velocity versus time. So, notice on here, I change from a going up with a positive acceleration down to a, po to a negative acceleration. So here's my question. This is my velocity time graph. Okay, this is my velocity time graph. I went from a positive acceleration to a negative acceleration. Mr. Fisher, did I change the direction at the top of that peak? Yes. Because, no, you did not. You just started slowing down. Because this is my velocity time graph, right? How do you show a change in direction on a velocity time graph? What yeah. does it have to go through? You have to cross the x-axis. Bingo. So here's my x-axis of zero. So I only changed direction one time because it only went through zero meters per second one time. So I had a positive acceleration, and I was moving up because I had positive velocity. Now. I still have positive velocity, so my ship was still going up. I was just slowing down as I was going up. Okay? I was still going up, I was just slowing down. I crossed into zero, then I begin to speed up because I'm going from zero into a negative velocity with negative acceleration. And then notice that this line changes right here. Notice I changed the slope of that line. So this is a velocity time graph. So if I change the slope of my velocity time graph, notice I didn't say change the sign. If I just said I changed the value of the slope, I went from a big negative acceleration to a smaller negative acceleration. Think this through. Okay. Force net equals mass times acceleration. Force net equals force applied plus force opposing. The opposing force is gravity on the moon. I'm not going to change that number. So if I change the slope of this line, what did I have to do to the rocket? What did I have to change? What can I control? Can I control my flight force, my net force, or my opposing force? Which one do I control when I change the value of that main thruster? Force applied, force opposing, force net. Applied. Beautiful. So whenever you change the value of that main thruster, you're changing the value of the applied force. But by changing the value of the applied force, by default, you change the value of the net force. By changing the value of the net force, then you change the acceleration of the rocket. Okay, so the other thing that you can do is down here, there's like a slide bar. So if you click on that, you can go through and recreate the path of this thing, okay? So at this point, when I was landing, notice that I had negative velocity, okay? Because I have to land with negative velocity because I have to be, <laughs> the ship has to be going down to land, okay? Pretty simple. But notice that I had positive acceleration. So notice here I have positive acceleration, okay, with negative velocity. So am I speeding up or slowing down? Madonna, I have positive acceleration, negative velocity. Am I speeding up or slowing down? Yeah, I'm slowing down because these have opposite signs. I can also look at my velocity time graph and go, oh, this graph is approaching zero meters per second, so I'm slowing down that way. Okay. Stop that camera. Okay, so what I have on the lab for tomorrow, there's, there's going to be two distinct. We're going to start. We're just going to start this today. We'll finish it up tomorrow. So up here, I've given you the parameters of the lab: gravitational acceleration on the moon, negative one point six seven meters per second squared. Mass, 5,000 kilograms, anything, anything, up and right is positive, anything, left and down is negative. Velocity, displacement, acceleration, doesn't make any difference. So, just like I guarantee you, NASA, before they turn you loose on flying something, you have to be able to prove that you understand Newton's laws of motion. 
same thing's going to happen with me. So what you have is a whole series of questions on page one and two. So tomorrow, what's going to happen is that you're going to have page one, page two. Do not worry about the second page. We'll deal with the second page tomorrow. Okay? Do not worry about this part of it. Only worry about this part. So by tomorrow, you're going to come up to me and you're going to go, Mr. Burkamp, here's my proof that I know Newton's laws of motion. And I'm going to look through it, and if, there's, if you need to change anything, which is often the case, then I'm going to say, hey, go back and change this, because I want you to have this right before you actually start the program. Okay? Now, pay attention to a bunch of things. So down here on number eight, uh, I said, worst case scenario, you're traveling at negative 1.22, conforcing yourself to complete engine failure, what velocity do you land on the moon? Okay? So notice on number eight, you've got to go old school. You've got to use that equation, okay, because you don't have time. Uh, on number six, I ask you to, to make a free body diagram sketch off to the left, okay? When you get to question number nine on the back side, you have to make another free body diagram. So on every one of these problems, start with the idea that net force equals force applied plus force opposing. Now, you're going to have to deal with horizontal motion as well, okay? On the moon, there is no atmosphere, okay? So horizontally, there is no mafia, okay? The only mafia that exists on the moon is gravity, okay? That's it. And they're not as strong as they are on Earth. So your only time you're going to have an opposing force on the moon is when you have gravity. If you fire the side engines left and right, there's no, there's no air, there's no wind resistance, there's no Martians, and there's no alien squirrels, nothing. So when in doubt, when in doubt, start with the idea that net force equals force applied plus force opposing. Okay, start with that idea. Okay, stop that, we're done.